everyone. Welcome. We're so pleased to have you joining us tonight. I just opened up the webinar, so I'm seeing the audience joining us here in this virtual space, and I'm so pleased to see all of these wonderful um, names here with us tonight. Thank you for joining us. So um, my name is Carol Centers, and I am so thrilled to have this day here with us. Uh, we are, we've been waiting for the celebration of Earth Medicines, which came out over the winter time, and we've been super eager to host this event with Felicia Cocotzin Ruiz. As I mentioned, my name is Carol Centers, and I'm the events director here at Bookshop Santa Cruz, where I'm broadcasting live. And we are going to have a presentation, a conversation tonight um, with Felicia. And we welcome the audience as well to be part of that conversation by asking your questions in the Q&A tab. So um, we would love to know kind of what you want to learn about tonight with earth medicines and where your interests are as well. So before we get started, I'm going to show you where to add your questions and give a quick overview of the event platform here. We are in a Zoom webinar. Uh, we cannot see you or hear you at home, but we are, of course, all here together. And I welcome you to drop a line in the chat if you feel so inclined to let us know where you're tuning in from. It's nice to create what community we can here, and thank you in advance for being respectful. Uh, and you can find, as I mentioned, the Q&A tab where you will be uh, adding your questions if you have them. You can find that at the bottom of your screen, and you can just mention, you can um, add those questions anytime as they occur to you, and we will um, be so happy to include you in our conversation tonight. I also want to mention that closed captioning is automatically on. You can hide it if you'd like. If you find it um, distracting, you can, you can hide it, but it helps to make this event accessible for people. This event is being recorded uh, so that you can rewatch it. If you miss anything, you can share it with your friends. We'll send out that link tomorrow evening, about 24 hours from now, or you can find the replay on our YouTube page later this evening, and I'll put some links in the chat a little bit later. We do recommend purchasing your book. If you don't already have one, you're definitely gonna to wanna to want a copy of Earth Medicines. Um, and also your purchase supports our local jobs here in Santa Cruz, supports independent culture, and it shows publishers that our audience is invested and engaged through our events program. So thank you in advance for your purchase. We do have some great stuff coming up. Uh, author events are now both in-person and virtual, and we have another free virtual event with Leopoldo Gout and Ava Argis for Monarca on Thursday, April 21st. It's a beautiful fable of a, about a butterfly transformation that we hope you'll join us for. And we also have a ticketed event coming up virtually uh, with Mieko Kawakami, uh, All the Lovers in the Night. That's going to be on Monday, May 2nd, and we're really excited about that. So if you like fiction, we, we hope, hope to see you back for that one as well. Definitely check back our website for upcoming schedule, and I'll put that in the chat as well. But now on to the main attraction. Felicia Cocotzin Ruiz is a corandera, an indigenous foods activist, whose work is deeply rooted in the healing properties of sacred plants. Sharing the medicine of the people, Felicia weaves together stories of indigenous wisdom with the intention of her recipes. Her work has been featured in Food and Wine, Spirituality and Health, and on Padma Lakshmi's Taste the Nation, among many other platforms. Felicia lives with her husband in Phoenix, Arizona, where she's joining us from tonight, and where she works with the sun, the moon, and the elements, offering medicine workshops and one-on-one -on -one healing sessions for her community. I'm so thrilled to be joined by Felicia. Please join me in welcoming her to our screens. Good Hi. Hi, everyone. Oh, we're so glad you're here, and I just love seeing that beautiful desert sunshine just Blessing our screens with your presence. So lovely. Feels good. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, so yeah, I would love it if you, if we kind of get started with talking about the origins of the book and how you came to write it. Um, it's such a rich book. There's beautiful photographs in it. And um, I'd love to get into a little bit later kind of how you structured it as well. So maybe you can just kind of start by the vision of the book and how it came to be. 
Sure, so I really didn't have a vision for the book for a very long time. I knew I was going to write a book and my goal was to always write a book by the time I was 50. And the book came out um, two months before I turned 50 or two months after I turned 50. So I was wow. right on, on my target. Yeah. And you know, when I put it out into, I guess the universe that I wanted to write a book, um, I wanted to write a book because because I had so many incredible life experiences and I had never really seen a book like the kind of book I wanted to write, but I really didn't know what I was going to write, how it was going to be. Um, when I was contacted by my publisher, um, they really saw my food element, how it was very different being a curandera and having the food be really my primary, uh, the foundation of, of most of what I did. And so that is probably when I really saw a vision of how I wanted to create the book. And that's how I ended up breaking it down into the four chapters, which were the four elements. Yeah, I love that, how there's the, the earth, air, fire, and water, and each one has different applications, I guess you could say, um, spiritual practices, recipes for food and medicines and, um, you know, even hair, hair recipes and just everything you could want in a way. Um, so did you, how did you come upon these recipes? Did you develop them yourself? Many of them I developed just on my own by trial and error. Um, like I would just think, oh, I think this I, this might work and sometimes it didn't work, but there are things that I've used over the course of my life. So some of the recipes were things that um, that I still use every day, daily, and some things were things that I created specifically for the book because I recognized because I was breaking it up into four chapters and then into three subsections, um, beauty, you know, the, the food part, the herbal part, um, and the spiritual part. That some, I, I realized I didn't necessarily have recipes, but I knew, I don't know, like I had written notes about them, or maybe I just had had it in my mind, but I didn't actually have a recipe or an entry. So it really, um, it got my creative juices going because I had to think in an abstract way to get those into those three subsections. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And did you kind of, from taking those recipes that you had been using from your life and putting them down on paper, like, okay, like the dry shampoo recipe, for example, where it's the arrowroot powder and then certain essential oils. Um, and you say you don't necessarily have to measure exactly this or exactly that but how was it to kind of develop them on paper so that it was like a script that we could follow right so that was the probably one of the harder parts for me because i don't measure a lot of things and it's not baking so um and it's always fluid and changing and evolving depending you know or what's just on hand in my pantry or my apothecary so you know, when the editor was like, we need an actual recipe for these things, like how many drops, you know, is it <laughs> teaspoon? And so it was kind of funny because it, it, um, it showed me a little discipline too of having to really write these things out so that, you know, everyone like you could actually put it together and use it because I'm one of those cooks that learned by a lot of grandmother's sides where it was like a mug of this a pinch of that you know stir the pot like you know it, it was like i didn't really have um i had the language for it but it was just very different and it was fun like now i'm i feel like i'm an expert recipe writer <laughs> right did it take a lot of did you have to kind of tr do a lot of experimentation with okay a cup is too much or three drops is gonna smell too too much healing i can't handle it like yes it was um i mean everything in the book is to my preference and that's why i really make a point of saying over and over again like you if you don't have this or this is not suitable for you then use something else or you i throughout the entire book i say try to use things that are an ancestral ingredient for you because it's going to be more special that way. Mm -hmm. So that that was really important for me. I think the only um, part where I really felt adamant about make sure it's this amount was 
for essential oils, putting it on your skin because I didn't want the dilution to be too strong. Having gone through aromatherapy school over 20 plus years ago, that was important to me that I wanted to make sure that people were using it properly or they weren't using it if they were a pregnant person or breastfeeding or things like that. To, that that's why I was really cautious and making sure that everything was spot on. Got it, beautiful, and the rest is much more kind of I feel or you kind of invite us to trust our own instincts and our own experiences with what works best for us which I yeah. love yes. um, we have a comment here which I love um, from Ayatha I remember asking my grandmother for some of her recipes and it was often a pinch a handful a splash a bit etc when I asked her to be specific she just laughed <laughs> It's true, though, because I think all grandmas know, or not necessarily all grandmas, but a lot of grandmas know, you know, that um, the best meals are always, it sounds kind of um, cliche or cheesy, but they're, they truly are made with love, and that's what makes everything so special, because you can get a room full of people all creating the exact same recipe. It's going to taste different for each person. The outcome's going to be different, and it all just depends how somebody, you know, um, trusted themselves to create whatever it was that they were making. Wow. <clears throat> Amazing that something that is kind of intangible like that is can become something that you can taste and feel and eat and hold in your hands, and it's just such a beautiful practice, I think. Yeah. Um, can you tell us about the gathering aspect of it and kind of uh, having a garden and also wild um, collecting and things like that. How does that play in? Uh, well, I teach a lot of classes on foraging, not so much since we've been in the pandemic, but beforehand um, through different herbal schools, our desert botanical garden, and just like my local community, I would host uh, workshops where I would teach people how to wild craft or forage um, rooted in, in indigenous ways so that it was which is all about taking only what you need um, bringing something for the plants that you're taking from you know the gratitude aspect um, how to actually cut a plant properly um, so it wasn't just about the gathering it was it was actually this whole uh, ritual of foraging and how did you learn to do that? Where did your knowledge kind of come from? So many different avenues. So when I was small, my great grandmother was the one who first took me on, um, you know, she didn't call it a wild crafting adventure. It was just following her with a paper bag. And um, she was just getting things you know from the ground and putting I was you know we were putting them in the bag and then I honestly we didn't really say too much like I just remember going back and then she was making these preparations with them and that just really planted a seed um, at, in me at a very young age and I had aunties that also were doing similar work in New Mexico and so back here in Arizona, because this is where I grew up, the plants are very different than Northern New Mexico, where I was seeing people gather things. And so here I created relationships with many different um, indigenous uh, grandmothers of our Sonoran Desert. We have, very, we have uh, many different tribes in Arizona, but even in Southern Arizona. And so, um, those really have been my teachers. And sometimes they didn't even speak English and I would have a translator with me uh, translating in their native tongue to what it was that I was learning. And that really was the most valuable um, education I've ever had because a lot of this knowledge is being lost just because of the elders um, getting older and, and passing on with that wisdom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how did you connect with those elders? How did you, um, did they trust you right away to kind of, how did you show them that you were 
um, there and that's, you know, that you were the right, <laughs> they, they could trust you, I guess. Yeah, so I think part of it is just like, I feel that I'm a good energy reader and I would believe that they are also a good energy reader. Mm -hmm. But besides that, we always had um, a middle person that was making the introduction. So it wasn't just like a random person, you know, it was always somebody said, oh, uh, my auntie, you know, sh she's 80 years old and she knows all of the plants of this area. I think you should meet her because even they would say, I have no interest in learning this. And it was maybe they didn't have time or they were already in, involved in many other things but I wanted to know, and they knew that about me. So then they would give me that introduction. And I think because here in the Phoenix area, um, I guess the word curandera, it's something that your community has to recognize you as before you can just call yourself a curandera. And so I think for the elders to hear that other people were um, calling me that already gave them a sense of trust of, um, okay, this woman is, you know, serious about learning some of our ancestral um, plants and foods. Totally. It wasn't just you, you know, declaring yourself this person, it was this vetting and this this uplift from people that had experienced your power, your energy. Exactly, yeah, energy. Mm -hmm. Love that, yeah. And curiosity, um, curiosity. Yeah, curiosity is such a, such a powerful force, I think, in when it's, when it's used with respect and to kind of have that outlet for such incredible knowledge, um, to be, to find its place um, or to find a, a place for it to land. Because yeah, these practice, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I, I was gonna say, as you were saying that, I, I also want to add that I believe that another reason why I was welcomed very easily in many different communities and circles, you know, because of that introduction, um, being another indigenous person just of a different community I think was important to them um, mm -hmm. a lot of the elders they don't want to share information with people that are not native themselves just for the mere fact that so much information has been written by non-indigenous people and they're profiting off of that so I think that they saw as a curandera like I wanted to use the plants um, not only to find my own footing in, in the land that did raise me, as I say in the book, but it was also that whatever wisdom I was learning, I was passing it on as medicine for my community. So it wasn't just gathering information and then, you know, publishing it. It, it was like it actually, it's a living tradition. And, it, and so it was in motion with, with our exchange. Thank you for making that distinction. Um, I'd like to, I'd love it if we go through the book a little bit too and look at um, each chapter a little bit. Um, and part of, we could jump in with water, which is um, which is one of the, which is the first chapter. Um, and it, we have a question actually come in from Marcelina, which is about water. It's a little bit specific, but it can kick us off here. She has a question about drinking water from copper containers, which is on page 28. Can this be done too much? She asks, I worry about heavy metal toxicity and also is this okay and healthy to do with children? Thank you. I didn't hear the very last part. Is it okay to drink uh, the water from copper with children? Oh, with children. Um, so my teachers have always said it was fine for everyone. And these were Ayurvedic uh, teachers um, of Indian descent. I believe any metal can be um, taken, I, I, any metal can be taken in excess, right? Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of drinking a lot of water and you're not only drinking from the copper vessel all day long, you're just drinking what it suggests in the recipe. So that's just to get some copper into your body. Um, from my um interactions with different people when they get blood work back even a lot of them are actually low on uh, magnesium and copper and iron and all sorts of deficiencies so that's why i'm not a doctor i'm a curandera so i always tell people do your own research mm -hmm. but 
again, it's about just having a cup of water and not having perhaps a gallon of water all day. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Um, yeah. So is, are you saying that like, um, you're not drinking a whole gallon of copper um, right. so water? You have maybe a cup of from the copper yeah. and you're drinking water. Yeah, the tamra jaw from what I was taught, you know, it's, the, it's like your the containers are relatively small. So you're just making your um, water and I can drink a whole one, I, you know, in the morning time, mm -hmm. but I give myself a break as well. Like I don't drink it every single day, but it's a nice way. It's like cooking in a cast iron pan. You are getting trace elements of iron. And so I don't think there's like anyone out there saying, and you shouldn't cook in an iron pan every cast iron pan every single day. I would rather eat off of a cast iron pan than a Teflon pan, but we don't question those things equally. So to me, the, the Tamra jaw, it's something that you're just doing to help get some copper into your body, um, which is really wonderful for um, like your skin rejuvenation, your hair. Beautiful. Got it. Thank you so much. And yeah, that um, that's on page 28, as Marcelina just um, told us. And the, um, there's a few water recipes, there's, there's a number of water recipes in here. Um, and I love how there are different um, streams or different disciplines. So there's Ayurvedic in here. You talk about, um, I believe it's the, oh, from Morocco, you really feel a strong affinity with different Moroccan practices and elements too. Um, so yeah, I love that there's, um, traditional practices from all around the world as well that kind of inform your recipes, right. which is beautiful. It's earth medicines. So earth I mean medicines, <laughs> yes, exactly. It's a whole big planet that we have here. So yeah. um, so it's in terms of water, just taking a step back here, um, you you so you talk about um, there's the th there's the four kind of elements and then there's the three approaches that you kind of look through the lens of each one. Can you tell us a little bit about how you kind of came to those three um, different different important? How did you know the importance of those three pieces? Right. So I took all of the components of I guess myself to you know put the book together. So I'm very well known for cooking and that had to be in there. So that's why that first chapter or the first part of each um, element is all about either a food or a beverage, ways that you can um, work with the elements, uh, whether it was with water or cooking with fire, things like that. And then the beauty part, it wasn't necessarily about like how to be beautiful. So it wasn't in that way. It was more about like inner beauty, but then also just like body care recipes, any of that self care. Um, I've always been a, a big believer in creating your own products if possible, just because I don't know, maybe long ago it was like kind of what do you call like granola or you know kind of hippie-ish like back then that's what maybe it was called but I think um, as we hit the 90s that's when so many of our products um, for body became extremely toxic with chemicals like aluminums and all sorts of things that weren't good to be putting on our body every single day and so I wanted to make sure I had a chapter in there that included recipes for your skin your hair um, and everything in between. And then the last chapter, which is also a big part of my life is my spiritual practice. Um, I didn't want it to feel religious in any way. I myself am not a religious person, but I wanted people to be able to, I guess more than anything, connect with their ancestors and use that as the starting point for a spiritual practice if they didn't already have one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's such a wonderful way to be able to connect, I think, in a spiritual way is through the living earth and both taking that into your body as food and as medicine. And then, I mean, we do have, these are our bodies externally, which these are what allow us to experience life. You know, our skin is our largest organ and our eyes allow us to see. And, you know, for those of us that have sight and um, it's like, it, 
it's not materialistic. It's like, it's actually, that is kind of a deep spiritual practice to self care, um, this vessel that we've been given in a way, mm -hmm. but it seems like it fits really well and they complement each other in this really lovely way. Um, yeah. And, um, so going through and kind of seeing the, um, I'm just looking at the pictures as well. Um, and maybe you can talk at some point about the photography. Um, but, um, so you have aromatherapy, hydrotherapy, you also have, maybe we can talk a little bit, we talked about the foraging. Can you talk a little bit about the garden, the herb garden and the kind of, um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name that you call it. Um, the wellness garden, is it? Or, yeah. Um, I'm not sure, okay. but. Um, yeah, basically herbal your, garden. your herbal garden. Yeah, your herbal garden. <laughs> <laughs> wellness garden, yeah. So, um, before the pandemic, I actually for many years had um, a 100 foot row at a community space for indigenous people. And that's where I grew a lot of my herbs because we had our compost there, we had a drip system. Like I was able to grow a lot of different plants that you actually see in the book. Um, and then unfortunately we had to close during the pandemic. And so now it's just what I can grow around me in pots and things. but. It's um, growing anything has always been a, um, such an integral part of my wellness plan because I'm able to take care of the plant and talk to the plants and give it all the love that it needs. And that way, when I'm using it, even if for any of the recipes, a tea for a steam, it just seems really special. And especially when I had the garden row, I mean, the barrage, which I know is is in, in the fire chapter, it's um, so, I mean, it just goes crazy if you've never grown barrage before. It's, it's super, uh, it, it's abundant and you wanna just cut it and give it away because it, it's a lot. And so that's how I feel about the garden when I'm growing all of the herbs. It's not just for me, but I would trade with other people um, I would do workshops and we would use the herbs from there. It was really important to me because I wanted people to um, see how accessible and easy it was to grow medicine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I love how there's that community practice even in something where it's your own garden, but yeah. it's an, another opportunity to connect with the people around you. And that's just beautiful. Right. So in, in curanderismo, which is um, what I practice, that's what it's all about. It's the medicine of the people. Mm. And so it would be funny for me to just collect and just have all of these herbs, unless I was perhaps selling and, and creating things to give away. But mm -hmm. it really is about, um, it's, it's about the community, mm. the, the collective wellness of the community. Mm. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, more about water um, before we kind of um, keep going to air, but um, you talk about drinking water from a street or from a from the source, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that the picture that goes along with it, um, which of course now I won't be able to find, <laughs> but you, um, you have a beautiful picture of this water falling very far into yeah. a jar. And I was hoping you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's at the, um, at the beginning. And that, um, so that's an actual spring that I go to and I can't get to it all the time because it's still a little uh, dry for me. But every time I am able to get up there, I definitely bring as many jugs as possible and bring home all of that amazing spring water. And I, now you have me wanting to. It's um, such an incredible picture. Yeah. yeah. So the so actually this picture here, so it would be sixty four. Ah, thank you. So that's the spring that I go to, and then the picture actually right before it is at the same spring, mm -hmm. and that's actually um, a, a Mexican silver bracelet, and I just talk about you know um, this the healing properties of the spring water and I was always taught that when you go to a spring um, that's when you maybe cleanse your jewelry or mm -hmm. your sacred tools if that's you know for me as a curandera I, I have different tools I use and if they're not you know songs are waterproof 
we put them under the um, spring, the spring mm -hmm. water and let them um, cleanse that way. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and the photographer, um, who's a dear friend of mine, I mean, she really captured so such beautiful moments um, on our journey together. Yeah, there's such life in this photo, um, just in the way that it's falling and then the way that it's bubbling out of the jar. It's just so, so powerful. And yeah, you talk about um, just drinking from this, being at that source, which I love, yeah, and, and it makes sense that that would be a place to kind of cleanse because it's that energy that's coming right from the earth. And um, yeah, it kind of maybe in a way is a moment, a, a connective moment of before we went and polluted the street. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not laughing because it's funny. It's just hard, you know, um, before we went and kind of ruined some of those sources of life because water is life. Um, it's like these rare places where you can still do that and how sacred of a thing that is to honor that. Right. And, you know, the reason why I wanted that in there as well is because I don't know, I don't, I didn't write, say this in the book, but I've heard it so many times. Like people always will ask me, well, aren't you afraid to drink that water? You know, aren't you scared, you know, that you might get sick or something? And kind of going back to what I said about the Teflon pan, like people don't really ask, well, can I get sick from be eating off a Teflon pan every day and it's the same thing as like well how safe is it for us to drink out of plastic bottles every day and how is the plastic you know is it really being recycled or is it just going into the landfill or it's, it's a single use piece so for me taking my big you know jars my my gallon glass jars or jugs and filling up like it's a busy spring and that's what I talk about in the book is that mm. if there's a lot of people there that's a good thing because that means that it's in use people mm. it's being checked regularly people are there to benefit from all of the um, minerals from the water and so I do always think it's funny when you know people ask well, aren't you scared I'm like actually no I'm more scared to drink out of you know some of the other things than I am to drink mm -hmm. right out of that spigot. Yeah, those plastic flats from Costco with the single <laughs> use that sit in the sun and, you know, yeah. we don't know what the effects of that might be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, fascinating. And even like, like you were saying with the 90s of the toxicity of products and yeah, it's like we, we put our trust into companies that make products that you know, that really make people very, like Johnson & Johnson's baby powder that make, that give people cancer. And you know, that we maybe are placing our trust in the wrong places, potentially. Um, I love your skincare chapters as well, um, which I think a lot of them are in the water chapter because of um, the moisturization qualities of that. So um, yeah, you have the Life Force hair gel, which I cannot wait to try. I'm really excited about that. And you talk about braiding your hair and when you braid your hair and apply those products, you are, um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but kind of what you talk about is like, you put your well wishes in and tightly braid them so that they can stay with you. Um, which I just found that so, such a beautiful idea. I haven't tried that before. And I, do you find that you, when you take the hair out then, do you, do you feel any kind of energetic release of that or out breath of those well wishes? What is that like? I don't, I personally don't feel like that out breath, but I think for indigenous people, at least in my community, I can't speak for every indigenous community, but hair generally is very important um, for many of us. Um, there's specific styles we might do. Um, there's times we cut our hair, you know, maybe there's different products we put on our hair. And so for me, what I was taught, one of the many things I've been taught about braiding my hair, and if you look at pictures from when I was little, I, I wear braids a lot. And I look back when I was a kid and I still had, you know, my braids went down the hair. I actually just cut off a whole bunch of hair. But I was taught that your three braids, your trenzas, the one strand is for your future, one strand is for your past, and one strand is for your present. And so to feel, you know, like you're just all here, you braid them together. So you're like putting out your 
intentions. You're also being present, but you're also the stories of your past and you can choose which stories you want to honor. But when you're, so you're braiding your hair, you're putting all of that thought into your braid. You're not just creating a hairdo. And so um, I feel like when my hair um, is down, I, I've talked about this often um, on like my Instagram post. I, I had a lot of trauma actually with um, childhood trauma with long hair. And I feel very safe with my hair braided. Mm -hmm. My hair actually was way down to my waist all the way through probably eighth grade. And as a girl, um, I remember sitting in class and um, I remember a boy cut my hair while he was behind me in class and because my hair was just down and I had no idea he had even done that. Hmm. And I remember another time, um, I believe, you know, this was in elementary school, but I actually was attacked by a group of kids who uh, really traumatized me with pulling my hair. Um, and for me, when my hair is loose, even as an adult, I feel a little vulnerable because I feel like my hair is out there um, picking up energy and um, in people's space. And so that's what I mean that even in our tradition, like having your hair braided, it's symbolic of just almost like keeping all of your thoughts to yourself, keeping your energy to yourself. Mm -hmm. And it, it's important. Mm -hmm. it's important. That's why I called that um, gel life force, you know, wow. because it is your, your antennas, your life uh -huh. force. Yes, you're kind of containing it and, and protecting and preserving and, and yeah, mm -hmm. not just letting it out there for any force to kind of, yeah, got okay. it. Wow, thank you for sharing that. That's really, and I'm so sorry that that happened. Um, we could talk about water for a while longer. Um, but let's move on to air. Um, was that so, your favorite? Was that your favorite? Um, I'm a I'm a water lover. Um, so, but I also loved the fire as well. So I'm excited. But um, but I love too. Just yeah, the water and the you talk about your husband who does healing work with um, with people and the kind of submerging and hot springs and there's just so much there. There's such a versatility there that it's yeah, it's really wonderful. Yeah. Um, but yes, um, with the air as well, I love that you also open with kind of a, with prayers on each one. Um, so that's, that's beautiful. Did you write those prayers yourself or are they kind of a, yeah. Everything in the book is written by me except for the forward. <laughs> oh, okay. Which is written by your aunt, right? Uh-huh. Cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what, tell us a little bit about air. What I know for the, like in the, in like tarot and stuff, air is the thinking, the mental practice. Um, so yeah, what, what, what else is it about air? Yeah, I would say um, universally speaking, I would imagine all traditions at their root have that same concept of air. I mean, we can't see it, mm -hmm. and I think, but we know we need it to survive and to live. And I think there's always been this um, notion that perhaps whatever people want to call angels or spirit guides or ancestors or God, whatever that feels like, or whatever your language is, that it's like somehow out in the air oftentimes. And so it was um, something that, you know, I was taught as far as like even the smoke, you know, the smoke rises up back to creator. Um, we light, you know, candles and we burn things. And like, there's a lot that happens with air that I think um, of all of the elements, it's probably the one that people think the least about because mm. they can't see it. And we breathe without telling ourselves we need to breathe. Yes, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, I was thinking like, well, we can't, we can't live much long, we, we can live, so we need food, but we need water kind of more, like we, we would die for sooner without water, and then I realized, actually air, we would really be <laughs> without air, you know, and then we'd really be, that is so essential, and it's true, we, we kind of, because it happens without our needing to, oh, I gotta go drink a glass of water, I got you know, we just breathe, mm -hmm. and it's so powerful when we can use our breath to 
calm ourselves or in meditation. Um, and so it, there is such power there, even though it's so easy to take it for granted. Um, you talk about the, uh, so there's lots of breathing or not, there's a, there's an amount of breathing that happens in the air chapter. Um, you talk about plants and how house, how much you love house plants and how plants can act as an air purifier, mm -hmm. which I find very powerful. Um, yeah. which someone is asking about in the chat too, so or in the Q&A too. So I'd love if um, if you can talk a little bit about that part. Sure, do you wanna, what was the yeah. uh, next question? The question is, um, I have a black thumb and kill most plants I bring home. What would be your top three most used herbs or plants to grow for healing and recipes? And she's ho they're, they're hoping they can keep a few alive. Mm -hmm. I guess it would depend on kind of, you know, different, different climates and different temperatures are going to, you know, right. Be a part of, be a factor there, but yeah. I would say if you, if I had to recommend just one plant for anywhere in the country, I would suggest um, an aloe vera plant because one, you can use it just as is, you know, for burns, um, like an emollient and you can use it for different recipes. I have skincare recipes, recipes um, to actually create beverages from it. They're really hard to kill. And even if you think you killed one, it probably will come back to life <laughs> again if you just move it somewhere else and perhaps it needs different type of sunshine. They're, they're very tolerant. So that's probably what I would suggest. And then, Maybe as a second would be in a pot like um, lavender or rosemary. Those are, um, they don't like cold, but they do really well in, in um, for, for your group of people, I'm assuming most people are by the ocean. Mm -hmm. They tend to like that uh, Mediterranean kind of mm -hmm. air. Mm -hmm. And I definitely notice a lot of lavender and rosemary growing. Oh, um, okay around yeah outside so that's that's great it's so cool to know about the aloe vera i didn't know um, i didn't realize it was so hardy so that's cool. yeah it's really hardy it's um a lot of people think that it's actually a plant of the southwest but it actually arrived um with the africans and um it's definitely it's infused in my culture so much that I think a lot of people think that it's a Mexican um, plant, but when um, we were all being colonized, we took on other people's medicines and um, we found out also that aloe vera grew very well here. And so it's um, because of where it's from, it's, it's a very hardy plant. It doesn't need a lot of water. It, love sunshine and so it's it's really hard to kill wow i'm gonna go out and get an aloe vera too so hopefully hopefully that'll work for our questioner as well um and yeah you um you talk about the various places where you where you acquire house plants people give them to you find them on the side of the road and then also how you like to share house plants to kind of keep them going in different places so that's so special. Um, again, it's kind of that underlying sense of community that I guess infuses all of this. Right, right. Um, can you tell us a little bit too about, um, or is there anything else about air that, that you'd like to share? Any of your favorite recipes with air? Um, it's not really a recipe, but it's something that I enjoy often um, and probably more so in the last few days because it's been so windy here. But one of the entries is um, called Icaros of the Wind, which is uh, talking about wind chimes and just how beautiful that music can be to hear. And so <clears throat> I don't know, it's, it's again, it's some of these are not necessarily recipes. They're more like a suggestion of how to bring that element of air in without you know, a breathing exercise. It's just allowing the air to actually play those um, songs and music. Beautiful. Yeah, thank you. That's lovely. I remember my, my partner has a lot of wind chimes at his place and I've, I used to find them a little bit, you know, unpredictable noise or just feel like, what? But he said, you know, I love it because it's the voice of the wind. It gives the air a voice and it makes it, it brings it into our awareness in this way. And I changed my whole thinking about that. So I love that that it gives it a palpable quality. Um, yeah. Um, that's beautiful. I'm trying to 
find that here. Um, oh, and then I wanted to mention too, your speaking feather as well, which is in the, the last part of the air chapter. Um, can you tell us about what the, the practice of the speaking feather? Sure, so even though we're virtual, I still carry a speaking feather or, or have one. Um, it's just a practice that I started doing, I wanna say, I don't know, eight or so years ago, when I really started giving more um, talks in front of large groups of people. I used to, I, I've never had anxiety, I don't really get stage fright, but I think just getting up in front of a group of people can be a little, you know, heart pounding. So mm -hmm. I realized I needed um, a little pep talk of my own. And, and what I found useful was just imagining um, of course, this was in person, but just a, like a little bird going through the the audience, you know, whether it was, you know, wherever I was, you know, and just kind of like seeing from their perspective what everybody perhaps was just like the demographic. What was the demographic of my audience? You know, I was taught to, you know, speak to your audience, know who your audience is. So it was a mindful tool. Um, the feather was something, you know, this feather I have is rather large, but when I'm traveling, I have like a smaller feather. If I'm just going somewhere to speak, I'll just tuck it like in my book or my notes. And it really is a reminder to just take a second and be that little bird and, and to learn the audience. And it's a little bit of, um, I don't even know what, how to explain it, but not a good luck charm, but it's like, okay, this, you know, this feather is always with me when I'm doing these events, but, but the smaller one, I feel like it's, it's my own little bird I've been taking with me now over the years that it just really knows the, the energy of the group even more so. Wow. This one was a gift. Um, in, in my culture, uh, we often are, um, gifted feathers for important events and so this one was actually given to me for a ceremony last year and so it's really special and I love the color so I take I use it for things like this even yeah that's an amazing feather I love to imagine the bird that it came from and mm -hmm. wow. yeah it's a macaw oh wow mm -hmm. yeah. um Okay, well, if we're continuing with our <laughs> our journey through your book here, we are moving on to Earth. And um, you have a lot of, uh, again, beautiful photographs here. Here's some horses. Um, and um, yeah, tell us a little bit about, about Earth. Um, this one has some, um, you have a talk about cooking with earthenware as well as different um, scrubs and different things like that for the body part of it. Yeah, I'd love to hear some of your first impressions about Earth. Right. So I think as a cook, um, as a former restaurant owner, you know, cooking with clay and fire was one of my favorite things. Hmm. Um, I just, I don't know, the food tastes different when it's cooked in earthenware. It's, um, and even how you serve it, you know, Paper plates feel like picnic time, right? But when you just have like a nice earthen where a clay piece, a ceramic piece, it just feels different. Mm -hmm. And it elevates even, or it can even bring the, the food down. So if it's like a real fancy dish and you put it on a piece of a simple clay plate, it just actually makes it feel more home. Mm. So for me, that was really important to share about just all of the different traditions around the world, whether it was the Moroccan tagines or, you know, French cookware. Um, for me, the recipe that I included was cooking uh, just simple pinto beans in a clay pot. And they really do taste more, um, I don't know, flavorful than if you just cooked them in an Instapot or mm -hmm. a, um, I don't know, a pressure cooker or a slow cooker. Mm -hmm. I think about what you said with the trace minerals from the iron and the copper and how the earthenware probably is transmitting that. Yeah, maybe. definitely. And also, um, I don't know how to explain it, but it's like 
because it's like this porous kind of mm -hmm. um, material, I, I feel that it absorbs, it, it's like seasons, it gets well seasoned, just like you would have, you know, a seasoned cast iron pan. That is going, you know, that first time you cook with it, it's going to taste very different than when you've had a cast iron pan for 10 years. It just, wow. the seasoning is going to be different. Wow. Which again, just goes to that difference of kind of disposable culture versus something that you are imbuing with you know, so many meals and so many times, you're not just going to cast it away. You're, you know, it carries that history and that. All right. this mm -hmm. um, and I love, I love that there was some person at a potter's wheel, perhaps, mm -hmm. right? Just like creating this beautiful vessel. I think that's so special then. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I'm kind of romantic that way, but <laughs> I like that. That's what I love about the clay cookware is there a little imperfect and they're just different shapes and sizes and textures and i love that actual hands made them yeah. really really beautiful if you think about it it's clay and water you know mm. put together on a fire i mean you're really getting all of the elements you know together to create a pot oh i love that that's beautiful yeah and it's true, the, the material is such that you can, it's forged in the fire, but you can shape it with your hands versus, you know, metal or glass is, needs that hot, that heat while it's being formed, which is a little bit different than the clay. Um, that's so special. You also talk about um, gemstones and um, kind of the, um, the qualities of, you have here amethyst, um, and then some of the scents that go along with that. Um, and then also an altar, um, creating an ancestor altar, which is, um, she uses here. Um, and that is in the earth chapter, what, um, which I guess, I don't know, I guess I wouldn't think that right away. Yeah, which I guess it's just how you were um, brought up, right? Mm -hmm. So my example would be that Nowadays, it's very, um, I don't want to say the word trendy, but like for, like people use land acknowledgements now when they're coming together. Hmm. And as indigenous people, we don't have land acknowledgements because it's, we're on the, the land <laughs> of our people. And so it's more of a reverence for the land. And so it's a land reverence because we're taught that our ancestors, you know, when you pass, your your blood, your flesh, your bones return to the land. And so that's why it's connected in that way to the earth and mm -hmm. their ancestors, because it's return the, the physical part is returning back to the earth. Yes. Makes so much sense when you say that. And I, I think of like a forest and how you know, if a tree falls, um, it's not dead necessarily. It's then is becoming part of the forest and other organisms. It's being creating more life. Right. Um, so it's just like layers and layers, and that is that's totally the land. Um, such a layered and living, you know, cycles just happening right there. Yes. Um, yes. Thank you so much. Um, and. Your altar space, I just want to mention too, has a practice of kind of creating it, but then also um, kind of how to, um, what what living pieces. So it's not just making it and then having it there. It's also, um, you have the cloth and the aromatics and then calling their names. Um, so it's just this living presence that the altar has. It's not just something that you make and then forget about it. It's yeah, like a no. Yeah, it's, it's always changing. In fact, the candle that I didn't realize it till just now, but that's the candle here that's in the oh. book. And so oh. it's an example of your altar is always going by like how you feel, you know, what do you feel your ancestors are wanting on the altar at this time? Mm -hmm. so perhaps it's a special uh, birthday of someone that you love. So maybe you want to put something that you just know that they used to love to eat, right? Mm -hmm. Just just as a gesture of like, I remember you and I'm going to put this on the altar. Um, it could be 
um, maybe you want to play certain music while you're setting up that altar because it reminds you of that person. So it's always changing and evolving. And, uh, you know, I didn't include a picture of my real ancestor altar because that was very special and private to me. Um, but the one that we made for the book, um, I felt comfortable having my great grandmother in there and she's the one that I talk about in the book uh, that we called Grandma Chiquita because she was uh, known in her community as a curandera. That's why I wanted to honor her in the book. And then while I was writing um, the air chapter, actually my father passed away and that's why his picture is also there because I wanted to, in my own way, honor my father. Mm -hmm. And so his picture is there next to my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And so there's all these little things that, you know, are always changing. Sometimes I'll have um, little things that might not be there, you know, a week from now, but I always have the same things. And that's what I talk about. And it's the foundation of the book. It's at the four elements. So. I always have a candle, perhaps um, some incense, something that I can create like a smoke with. Some people might use Palo Santo or something like that. Um, a glass of water to, cause it's, it's, it's about letting them have a glass of water like in the spiritual world, but it's also just to acknowledge that element as well. And then um, the earth part, you know, that is with whatever you want. It could be a stone, rock, dirt it could be whatever you'd like mm -hmm. could it be like flowers or something yeah mm -hmm. okay got it thank you so much thank you for sharing that um i feel like in in uh, the culture in which i come from um which is just whatever you know um white culture i guess or whatever but i feel like ancestors don't really there's not the same reverence for um communication or honoring that happens um and i really appreciate your offering that as a um, something that's very important to do and it makes me want to do that so thank you so much yeah i i just want to say and, and this is just a personal thing to you like we all come from somewhere and we all come yeah. from people and we all have a lineage and that was such a big message for me to share in the book because I do see clients one on one and I see people from all different backgrounds and for those that they'll say things like I don't know I'm just white you know and, and I always feel like I want to help them you know and it, it does take a little research maybe to see where your family is from mm -hmm. but you know even me um, having been colonized as a, a group of people I carry Spanish blood and I it, it took me a while to feel comfortable wanting to honor those ancestors because that is also part of my lineage. But it was very healing for me to also connect to that side of me. And I think anyone listening or anyone um, that is reading the book, like, go and see who you're, where you come from. Find out because it's not just healing you, but it's healing your lineage as well. Thank you so much. Um, I want to mention that because you mentioned the one-on-one -on -one, uh, the work that you do, we had a question about whether you offer any online classes or programs. I thought it might be a moment where you could um, talk about that. Yeah, um, I get asked that often and I do offer online classes, however, they are usually in conjunction with another, um, like an, a, an, an organizer. So it's not something that's just through my website where people um, can sign up. Got it. Okay. Uh, if people are interested in um, kind of participating in that, would your website be the best place to learn more for that? So if you go onto my website, uh, the first thing that comes up is a prompt to sign up for the newsletter and it lets people uh, know where I'm going to be next. Um, so for instance, I'll be in Arkansas um, next weekend, I think, and I'll be teaching a workshop at um, a store there. So if I'm ever in Santa Cruz, maybe I can do a workshop at a store there. So I always, you know, um, 
I love I love working with people in person more than virtual because it's a lot of planning too to do virtual to get everyone mm -hmm. like the bundle so they can do it with me. So hopefully I can get to your neck of the woods soon. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, I just looked at the clock and realized it's already seven o'clock. Yes. I'm so sorry. I've been, you know, blabbing on forever. Um, but um, so I don't want to leave uh, fire out though. So maybe we can just quickly <laughs> talk about fire. Um, again, you talk about uh, Bora. There's a lot of stuff in the fire chapter. One of the things that I think is really so powerful in the prayer that you open the chapter with is how um, fire is both has the power to devour, I think is your word, an entire forest, which in California, you know, obviously we all, we all know very intimately, um, but it also has the power to hold space or like be a spark, um, like in that candle that's next to you. Mm -hmm. um, so there's just such an array with fire, I guess, with all the elements. but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, are there any kind of like things you want to say about fire? I think anyone that's feeling like stuck or in a rut or in a funk, whatever that, however you want to describe that feeling. I think we've all been there before. Um, fire is a beautiful element to work with. I mean, just now as you know, the sun is going down and my little candle feels even different than when I first sat down. It's like um, a little, flame of hope right and that's what i want people to feel uh with fire in small doses it's very special like that you know when it's a big fire it can feel very much so like devouring but um i like encouraging people to light those little candles when they're feeling in that space of sadness and darkness because it really does have that um optimism I think or reverence that's attached to it mm -hmm. yeah and I think of that song like this little light of mine yes you know I even just one little, yeah like even just one little flame can light up a dark room um and it may be in the daytime it wouldn't you wouldn't really notice it but then it depends on where you see it because it can illuminate something um mm -hmm. it's dark out. so yeah um there's also obviously many other, um, I feel bad that uh, fire's getting shunted here at the end, but you have even things like sun drying clothes and just very creative ways of um, engaging with fire. And um, obviously, oh, and even sun dried tomatoes, which I just want to mention, just things, um, ways of kind of, uh, again, um, kind of interacting with fire that I just love that so much that I wouldn't necessarily think of a sun-dried tomato. There it is, there's a way. Um, think outside, I guess the box is the same goes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, beautiful. Well, um, this hour has just evaporated. Um, so <laughs> I, I wish, I really hope that we can, so you mentioned you might be in Santa Cruz visiting, you have some family here. Um, so perhaps, um, we will get to have you drop by the store. I would love to see you in person. Um, and I just want to thank you so much for sharing this hour with us. Um, for everyone watching, if you don't yet have your copy, um, there is a link in the chat and you can find it on our website. Um, this book is, um, as I was telling Felicia before the event, just has so much, there's, there's beauty, there's like um, ways to kind of nourish your, your, your senses as you're looking at it. Mm -hmm. um, there are recipes and things that you want to open it up and use and try. Um, and then there's spiritual and reverent practices like we just talked about with the ancestry um, and various things that it just is such a feast. Um, I'm just in love with the book. So thank you so much for being here to share it with us. Thank you. Um, yes. I hope I can get to Santa Cruz and jump in your bookstore so we can see <laughs> in person. Definitely. Well, thank you, Felicia. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, and we hope everyone has a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining us.